share the screen. That one there, perhaps. Does that look like a slideshow to you guys? Yeah, yes. it's good to go. Right on, thank you. Hey, except it's not the right slideshow, so that's a problem. Let's get our group in a group here. How did I manage to do that? This is getting interesting all of a sudden. Yeah, that's not the one I wanted. Back to reality here, PowerPoints. For a ratio, oh, there it is. That's the one I want. Now, does that look better? Ratio control up on the screen there. Yes, yeah, sir. Yeah. Right on. Okay, so this one's uh, it's not a very long one. The ILM has actually shrunk uh, with the latest version, so it's about uh, about 32 pages, relatively straightforward. The math is not tricky at all. Uh, it's like the name says, it's ratio. So basically you're taking uh, one number and multiplying it by a calculated ratio and getting another number. So there's really only three variables that we have to worry about when we're, we're talking about ratio control. So this will be fairly easy uh, on the brain. That being said, uh, there is a lot of reading in the ILM because ratio uh, applications uh, are they vary quite a lot, and the ILMs go to some uh, extent in explaining the different types of applications. So the PowerPoint doesn't reflect uh, the operational steps of each of the different applications, just because uh, it would be a lot, it would make a lot more sense for you to kind of. Uh, look at the diagram as you're reading through the ILM so that you can kind of follow along with what each uh, particular application is trying to achieve. Um, but again, uh, like most of the other uh, ILMs that we've looked at, we, we start out talking about the, the simplest form of the application and then talking about each additional step that it takes uh, as it kind of technologically improves and uh, improves on the previous version of the application. So that's what you're gonna kind of be looking out for um, as we cruise along here. So uh, first objective here, Sarah, it says the described advantage is an application of ratio control. So what is ratio control? First thing that we, guess we need to know is what, what exactly is ratio control? And by ILM definition, it says that a ratio control strategy is one that maintains a controlled variable at a fixed ratio to another variable in order to keep a third variable at a desired value. So if we look at the diagram here, uh, this is a standard sort of pipeline kind of arrangement where we are taking in uh, heavy crude from uh, a refinery somewhere uh, and we are mixing it with condensate so that it's got a good enough, a nice viscosity that it's easy enough for us to pump. So we're making, mixing a heavy oil with the condensate, thinning it out, measuring the viscosity of that uh, product and then pumping it in, uh, goes into a surge tank where the, then it's pumped into, into the pipeline. So the idea here is to make a, a raw product that's really thick, uh, thinner to a measurable level so that it can be efficiently pumped through the pipeline. So a couple of issues that can happen and, and what ratio control uh, kind of does, um, sorry, is when we increase or decrease the amount of heavy oil that we're bringing in, we want to maintain that certain viscosity that we need so that it can pump down the pipeline. So the idea of the ratio control system is, is when this signal changes, increases or decreases, the flow of condensate would also increase or decrease in a particular ratio in order to maintain the viscosity that we want in order to maintain the the efficiency of our pumping process. 
So we have three variables, uh, three variables in the, in the ratio screen, screen here. Uh, we'll have a, a wild flow, a controlled flow, and then a, a vinyl flow, and we'll talk about those in the next couple of slides here. Okay, so the problem with that previous example um, is if the pipeline demand changes, the operator is going to have to adjust that flow transmitter 100 manually. So let's just go back to this and look at it. You see there's no connection here uh, between this flow transmitter, this flow controller, the level transmitter, the level controller. Nothing's going on here. So if this is plugging along at, uh, you know, uh, 500 cubes an hour and we increase it, to a thousand cubes an hour, well, this has no idea about it. So the operator is going to have to come over here, and he's going to have to increase that uh, in order to to meet up with the flow. He's going to have to double this flow or whatever he's going to have to do in order to maintain that. So the idea, of course, is building uh, on the system and the application. This is very primitive uh, and really a manual type of system. We want it to be, of course, automatic. So what do we have to do? So we need a scheme. And it's called a ratio control scheme. And a ratio control scheme does not require operator intervention. And again, its purpose is to prevent off spec products. So, in the case of our example, uh, the viscosity that we require for efficient pumping. Okay, so how does it work? Ratio multiplies by a ratio in order to calculate the set point for the controlled stream. The controlled process variable is not ratio so the control process variable what we got coming out is not the ratio <clears throat> uh, this should be uh, this should be eliminated actually uh, should have changed that at any rate uh, the terms that we're going to have here uh, that we deal with are wild flow in this case it's the heavy oil and controlled flow which is this, in this case here the condensate. So we have the variables, and you'll see over here on our flow computer on the FT100B, we have a multiplier. So what this multiplier does is going to take the calculated ratio, multiply the signal from the flow transmitter by that ratio, feed it into the flow controller of the condensate loop as its set point, which is in turn going to open and close this valve in a specified ratio related to that. That flow there. The formula that it uses right here, uh, QC, or the flow of the controlled variable, is a function of the ratio times the uh, flow of the wild variable. So just like it says here, QW times the ratio right here is equal to the signal that we get for QC. Okay, so the advantage of this scheme, of course, uh, versus the previous one where we had to have operator intervention is we have the, the connection here and the flow controller uh, linking the wild flow and the controlled flow together. So now any change that's made in the wild flow is going to be automatically applied uh, to the flow controller for the condensate flow valve. You'll see here we have uh, feedback, and we'll talk about feedback as we move forward uh, down the line here, but it's important to have feedback after we mix, because although we do apply a, a specific ratio that should keep things constant at this point here, if any of the physical properties of the wild flow or the control flow changed, uh, you know, the densities or concentrations or the thicknesses, et cetera, if any of those happen to change, it's not going to know about it here at this point, so it's important that we have this analyzer downstream, which is going to check the viscosity and make sure that it's right. And if it's not right, it'll correct for it. And that's called feedback trim, which is actually addressed uh, in another slide here. So here it is, feedback trim. Changing the viscosity of the heavy oil or condensate now using the, the feedback trim function, and that's everything included on the right-hand side here. The uh, analyzer's controller and the analyzer provide feedback in order to correct for any changes that would happen to the feedstock. Okay, first application that we look at here is a mixing type application, and it's the same thing that we've looked at uh, up till now, as we're just sticking two products here. Um, 
heavy oil and condensate and we're mixing them together. You see this diagram, of course, uh, a lot more complicated showing all the different things that we have, but this is essentially what is going on in the big picture. So um, when we're doing calculations using engineering units, and this is just uh, straight out of the ILM for you guys, because uh, we do look at it in two, in two kind of different formats. So this is uh, one or two of three different formulas. The first formula that we have to deal with is this one uh, right here, which we call direct ratio. And it just means that we're simply multiplying this number times a number to get another number. And then we look at some indirect ratios. And to get these indirect ratios, we have to take into consideration how uh, the capacity of each of these different flows affects each other. For direct ratio to work, it will only work if the capacity of both of the lines is exactly the same. Right, if it's zero to 2000 here and zero to 2000 here, well, then sure, multiplying by a direct ratio will work throughout the range. Um, in most situations, you don't have that, you'll have one range much higher than the other one. Uh, in this one, for example, we have two up to 2000 kilograms of heavy oil compared to up to 750 kilograms of condensate. If we apply that ratio straight through throughout the entire flowing range. At some point in time, most points in time, really, it's not going to be accurate because it's not linear in, in relation to the, the wild flow or to the heavy oil flow. So long story short, the old ILM used to talk more about that, but it does not anymore. Um, it's basically boiled down to just letting you know that if it's an indirect ratio, which most ratio schemes are based on, it's a function of it's a function of how much does the the other affect the other. And that is taken in, in another type of ratio. So we call that uh, the two styles, either engine, engineering unit style or fractional style. When it's engine, engineering unit style, we use this formula here, controlled flow over wild flow. And when it's percent signal or fractional, that's what RF stands for is, is ratio fractional. We use this formula and you'll see examples of these two formulas in the next couple of slides here. Okay, so as you would guess, uh, we mentioned these these two here. Most of the time, we're going to end up using this one. Again, it's kind of that technological advancement in, in the process design. So for, that was just the first application, so mixing. So next, we're going to get into the next batch of applications uh, that are covered in the ILM, and that is fuel metering or in particular fuel air ratio or furnace control. So we mentioned four schemes in the ILM, uh, which is in my opinion, three too many to get the idea of what's behind ratio control when we're talking about fuel air ratio. But um, I think most of you probably have a fairly good understanding of air fuel ratio. We talked about it uh, last year and third year in chemistry and in combustion analyzers. Um, and we did some calculations of stoichiometry and all this kind of wonderful stuff. And you might remember um, we did calculations for methane that said when we're, when we're burning methane, we're using 9.52 parts of methane for every part of, uh, sorry, 9.52 parts of oxygen for every part of methane, et cetera, et cetera. And that was stoichiometric. Um, when we're doing our calculations in the next uh, section here in the ILM, we're using an air fuel ratio of 10.6 for calculations. And it doesn't really say why or where uh, that comes from. Doesn't There's no lead up to it. It just kind of expects you to know. Well, we're using 10.6 and the reason for that is to uh, allow for that 2% of excess oxygen that we talked about uh, so much in, in third year. So back to the four schemes that we're talking about in terms of burner control. So we're gonna first look at series metering control. Uh, and when we look at the, the control scheme and where, where the signals are going, uh, that's what we're defining when we're calling it series. So when we look at the diagram, we'll walk you through where, this, where the signal is going in the path and you'll get the idea that, okay, that's that series, that makes sense. Then we'll look at parallel, which by virtue of signal travel uh, is represented uh, very well. And then cross metered, similarly, you'll see through how the signals travel, how that works. 
And then the last one here, I think, has actually been deleted in version 22 of the ILM, which I was just looking at this morning. So I did a quick edit of this PowerPoint this morning. I deleted about four or five slides, um, but there are a couple of things here I still missed, like this line, uh, which I'll take out of there. So let's look at some burners and uh, how they how they look and where these signals go. And the idea as we go through here is kind of just keep track of where the signal was going, how it's getting there, and then associating that signal travel with uh, the particular application. You get winded talking so fast here, I'm getting old. <clears throat> All right, so here's the first slide, uh, big old furnace. And we're calling this one series metering control. This is pages eight and nine in the ILM. And I'm just gonna check uh, to make sure. And sure as enough, there it is. So what does series mean? So the firing demand signal comes from temperature controller 100. So here we got the furnace and we wanna know how hot is uh, the product that we're heating up with this furnace. So how do we do that? with TT100, which feeds its signal into TC100. TC100 says I'm hot or I'm cold. If it says it's hot, uh, we're not going to send out a signal at this point in time, or the signal is going to be lower. Um, but let's say it's cold and we want to increase the furnace uh, temperature. So a signal comes out of the controller, and here we're looking for a series path. So follow along as we go. Comes out of the controller, gets fed over here into the flow control for the fuel valve. From the flow control from the fuel valve, you'll see the signal goes to the valve, which tells the valve to open, but it also splits off and the signal carries on in series and goes over here to the air fuel system. And there's a bunch of different steps in here that I'm not gonna speak to you right now, but this is all represented inside the block diagrams, uh, which we'll talk about here, but these are functions. Um, within uh, the flow controller and the DCS system that we have to configure. Long story short, we'll get to that later. But anyway, signal coming from the uh, TC100 through the flow controller 100 over through all these blocks, finally getting to the flow controller for the air fuel valve. So just, just, a, big old, just a big old series. So one after the other, after the other, they're in series. So in this case, the fuel flow is the wild, the airflow is controlled, and we have oxygen being measured for trim. The downside to this series metering uh, control scheme is that we cannot ensure excess air during uh, disturbance. So when we look at the next uh, application, which should be parallel, more than likely you're going to find that we have found a solution to how do we get uh, ver verification that we have the correct amount of excess oxygen. And that's measured by AT100, and we'll talk about that. Go ahead, Ray. Yeah, just with the wild uh, mixtures and the control, how would you be able to tell, like just, look, just looking at that diagram with it reading the sentence above it, how would you be able to tell which one is wild and which one is controlled? The one that is controlled gets the signal from the main measuring Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Is that? I mean, I don't think that's a bit. I don't think that's the right way to say it because here the fuel is wild, uh, but the air is controlled. So this uh, this gets this gets the bigger number. I'm trying to think of a good way to say it. This tells me I need to increase it. It's just t being told to increase, and this one is applying. The, the math the in order ratio. To does that make sense okay right yeah because you need to yeah. multiply the wild by the ratio for the controlled right yeah it's the one that's getting the math done to it right okay is, yeah is the control one i get that okay perfect so uh yeah this diagram does not exactly uh, represent this, but let's not worry about that. The main part we're concerned here and concerned with in this series method is where that series signal is that's telling the valve to open and close. We'll, we'll address it, uh, the oxygen trim section here in a second. Okay, so next slide, uh, parallel meeting control. So evolutionary uh, over series. 
So the firing event signal is still, of course, TC100, but in this case, you're going to notice that it goes to both the fuel and air controller in parallel. Uh, again, any text in yellow ties to a self-test question in the back of the ILM. So let's look at that signal. Uh, out of TC100, comes over here to uh, a connection. So we have a connection here and look at this, it breaks off and lo and behold, goes over to FC100 and also goes over to, uh, sorry, FC200 over here and FC100 over here. So by virtue of that split, it is now defined uh, as a parallel circuit, whether you're an electrician or a piping guy or a instrument guy, this is the difference between series and parallel. Instead of one after the other, it's now both of them at the same time. Again, fuel is the wild variable, air is the controlled variable. We have uh, oxygen for trim still via the air analyzer here, and this is actually this diagram. This should have been on the last page, and the last page's diagram should have been here. My bad. Anyway, so parallel, this is what we're trying to define. So looking at this diagram, you must be able to look at where the signal flow goes and identify it. So series, do, 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 parallel splits and goes to each one. Next one it is parallel. Oh, hey, sorry. They took these out of here. So perfect. We don't have to worry about it. There used to be uh, two other ones. So let's go back here. This one's gone. Parallel meter cross limited is gone, and so is characterizing the airflow signal. Hey, you guys got, you guys are getting things pretty easy here, so we're not going to worry about it. So the ILM does, however, talk about uh, parallel uh, calculations, doing engineering or fractional ratios, um, and that's covered on pages two, 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 uh, 10, 11, 12. And 13. Um, the only difference is uh, calculation wise, you'll see that the diagram uh, is exactly the same, it doesn't change. The only thing that changes whether we're talking about parallel engineering or parallel fractional is which formula is getting applied doing the math. So for engineering units, so we're talking about you know kilograms per uh, kilograms per hour or standard cubic meters per hour, whatever it is, we're using this formula. And if we're doing fractional, which is uh, this number over this number, we'll use this particular formula. And I'm not going to talk that much more about it because there's so little math in this ILM that uh, it's really just a theoretical fact for us. One thing I want to point out on page 11 of the ILM, I'm not sure if your page 11 is the same as my page 11. I'll just hold this up there. Uh, if your page 11 looks like this, I want you to make sure that these uh, signs here that look like minuses are not minuses. That's just really la bad labeling for the transmitters. So it should be FT100, FT200, or whatever it happens to be. Those are not subtraction signs in there. Threw me for a loop first time I saw it, so I just wanted to make sure that you guys were clear on that. <clears throat> All righty. Blank slide. Oh, well, you know what happened? I think I didn't save my last edit. That's one of my slides a little bit messed here. Okay, this is a uh, parallel meter cross limited. We're not we're not talking about that anymore. So that moves us on to blending, which I believe does happen in your ILM, and it does on page twenty one. So this is the third application uh i'm not sure i guess technically the difference between mixing and blending um is just the number of products i guess when we're mixing we're just taking two things and i guess blending we're doing more than two so blending third application so we talked about mixing the first one uh fuel air ratio or burner control which was the second application and the third application that we're going to talk about here is blending and in this case, analog blending, which doesn't matter for you guys because they took digital blending out of the ILM. So there. Okay, what is blending? Uses flow rate, 
controllers to blend the products in ratio to the flow rates of each stream. So just like the simpler uh, mixing uh, ratio scheme blending achieves uh, the same outcome, it provides a uh, product that is consistent, oops, consistent based on ratios of different streams compared to a, a wild stream. So as stream one increases or decreases, we have multipliers applied to each of the other streams in order to keep it in the correct ratio to maintain our product quality and our product specification. <clears throat> so this is standard blending and standard blending you'll see we measure the wild flow coming in and then we send that signal to the uh, additional streams and they come into the product line here and become blended. Next one we're going to look at is called side stream blending and what you got to pay attention to is where we're measuring and where we're introducing the, the other flows. Okay, so here's side stream blending and I better just make sure that you guys have this as you do. Page 23 mixes a stream with another before the stream is measured. Okay. So example in this case here, stream three is mixed with stream one before it's measured at the flow transmitter. <clears throat> Why, you ask, do they do this? Well, the only thing I can tell you is it's done with mixtures whose volume changes after blending. So the example in the ILM is when we're mixing ethanol uh, with gasoline. So uh, the volume, I guess, is, is changing based on uh, the density and the volatility of the liquid. It's all I can really uh, intelligently speak to uh, on this particular one here. But this is what you're looking for if you see uh, a couple of grams. This represents side stream blending when it gets introduced before the uh, measurement of the wild stream, whereas in regular analog inline blending, it's all measured in line. This is measured, this is measured, this is measured. Okay, next learning objective is block diagrams. And we get block diagrams lots and lots and lots in third year and also in fourth year. So being able to identify uh, the block diagram and the elements of a block diagram are very important, um, especially as we uh, get towards the end of the year, of course, representing, uh, recognizing a ratio diagram uh, as we sit here today should be pretty easy. Um, but at the end of the year, if I gave you a multiple choice question that had a, a feed forward diagram, uh, a regular feedback diagram, a multivariable diagram and a ratio diagram, and I said, which of the following is ratio, which of the following is feed forward, et cetera, that's where it's important to understand the block diagrams. And I don't want to make it just a, a memorize a picture thing for you guys. I want you to understand that block diagrams are uh, a very useful tool when it comes to understanding how everything uh, kind of works, you know, when you're staring at a page of paper rather than uh, trying to take in a whole plant. So to that end, let's look at some block diagrams. I do a very short and sweet. Um, the ILM takes a page, probably a page, page and a half for each block diagram just to uh, walk you through uh, what's going on in all the uh, diagrams, which is fine, um, but I'm not going to read them to you. I'm just going to show you the diagrams. Okay, so direct ratio diagram here. Um, again, taking a wild flow, multiplying it by uh, a ratio, and maintaining our viscosity. So the only thing that we're changing here is when we look at the block diagrams, <clears throat> is we'll look for a block diagram that has feedback or a block diagram that does not have feedback. This uh, kind of PID does not represent both of these, uh, but it does represent uh, a diagram that would have no feedback and a diagram that would, uh, would and would not have feedback, excuse me. <clears throat> and the ILM uh, now shows it this way. I used to show you uh, this diagram that correlates with this and this diagram that correlates with this. But 
they don't, so I don't know either. So no feedback. How do I know there's no feedback? Well, what what provides the feedback? Usually transmitter or from the plant. So I don't know what the hell I got going on here with feedback trim, without feedback trim. And these are the two diagrams. I'm uh, having a little bit of a brain fart right now. Let's just pretend that this is not happening. So these are the two diagrams, no feedback and with feedback. And I'm just totally having a brain fart here. Controller FC100. Oh, there we go. So this is the feedback loop coming in here that was throwing me off. All right, and like most of these, we have tuning. The tuning procedures, of course, are, are very specific uh, for each of the uh, different kind of uh, advanced strategies we look at, whether it's multivariable or cascade or selective or feed forward or ratio or whatever it is uh, to memorize them all. Uh, probably not something that's going to happen with you guys, um, but always key things to remember. Uh, tune at the point that you probably think you're going to be operating at. And follow the procedure. So here's a procedure for uh, a ratio, basic ratio here. Turn tune flow controller FC100 first. FC100 first with this in manual. So the idea is to get the uh, main loop tuned first before we start getting uh, fancy with it. Right, the, the AC100, this viscosity is feedback trim. Just make sure everything is going right after the fact. So first thing we have to do is tune the primary variable, which is in this case FC100. We want it to be tuned fast, but not unstable. So probably quarter amplitude decay. The second thing that we're gonna do once uh, once we get this, this tuned, so we're working on this one. This one's in manual because we don't want everything to get all screwed up. We get this thing tuned. We put it in automatic or, or cascade, and then we get tuning on this guy here. And the particular specification for, for ratio here says tuned to be five times slower than for the flow controller. And you may have things they have to deal with like uh, detuning for nonlinearities or characterizing or different things like that, but above your pay grade typically. Uh, use some integral, but don't use Derivative, again, derivatives, uh, derivative is usually reserved for slower processes and rarely, if ever, used on a flow loop as a general term. Okay, so integral, okay, so PI, but generally, almost never will you have derivative on a flow loop. Okay, parallel meter, a little bit different, uh, again, the procedure for parallel meter, let's just have a look here. Uh, yeah, it's like an entire page, so I'm not gonna read it out to you. Uh, long story short, again, tune the flow elements first, then put them in cascade, then tune the temperature controller to be five times slower, then turn the feedback trim to be five times slower than the temperature controller. And of course, the goal always to ensure excess air. So long-term, uh, long big picture summary here says indirect ratio will remove the nonlinearities of direct ratio control. Well, I guess this doesn't matter to you anymore because we really did not even talk that much about direct ratio control. Um, we, all math we did is indirect ratio control. Applications, we looked at uh, three of them, mixing, fuel to air ratio, and blending. Burner applications always require excess air. We talked about series, um, parallel. That's all we talked about. You guys got lucky. And then there were the rules for tuning cascade loops and nonlinearities applying also to tuning ratio control loops. So if you're a tuner, you're going to be a tuner and you'll focus on tuning and you'll know all this stuff. If you're going to be you and me working out in the field, uh, you're going to be referring to some notes probably.
fully fully do any tuning. So uh, good, luck, good luck with that. So that's ratio control. Um, self test in the back. Let me just have a gander here. Oh, you know what? Oh, yeah, see? This is in addition to the version 22 that I really addressed yet. And I chose not to address it uh, when I threw this in here earlier this morning. Uh, this is the DCS function block for a ratio control scheme. Um, the reason I'm not going to talk about it, and there's a page, page and a half in the ILM that talks about it. Um, we can look at this in control systems uh, when we uh, get talking about uh, function block diagrams. So uh, you'll see here it's got all the same elements that you'll find uh, in the block diagram if you want to take the time to go through it. Um, but read through it because it ties in with our uh, control systems scheme here. Um, but this would be your first little dip your toes in the water of uh, control systems and what you got coming to you. All right, so that's the end of uh, ratio control. The self-test in the back, um, pretty straightforward. Only a couple of little places where you have to apply uh, a couple of the formulas that we talked about here. But basically the idea um, in this IOM is to be able to identify the applications um, that ratio control is used in and the travel that the signal takes in order to accomplish that task in those particular applications. So overall, uh, not a super complicated uh, advanced control scheme, but it's one that's very, uh, very common. So there you go, ratio control. We can, uh, Those a uh, couple of things that we skipped over the parallel metered cross limited control and so those were things that those were uh, slides that were related to the previous version of the ILM and they obviously trimmed it down a little bit. So I went through this PowerPoint this morning and edited it, um, but I missed a couple of things in there and that was, that was one of them. So back in the day, like last year, when we talked about uh, air fuel ratio, uh, we talked about four different, four different styles and cross, cross limited was one of them. Uh, and they wiped it out of version 22 of the ILM. So rather than take up brain cells for you guys, I uh, we, we took them out. But I, there was a couple, just a couple things in the ILM that I didn't, I missed in my edit. Well, I like because I still have that in my uh, ILM, right? Page 18 still has the parallel metered cross limited control. Oh, would you look at that? You're right, it does. And I have uh, that. Uh, I think it's uh, parallel metered control with oxygen trim. I got I, that's in the ILM still too. All right, hang on back, hang on back. Let me back this up. Well, son of a gun. All right. Well, we'll talk about we'll talk about that for a little bit. Now, but now I'm uh, I'm a little bit concerned about how I've edited my PowerPoint. So let me just look at this here. Page 21, that's page 19. And you have parallel metered. So we talked about that. So we're just mission, we're just, I just didn't talk about this cross limited control. Right? That's all we're saying. So yeah, yeah. Let's yeah. look quickly, let's just quickly look at this. So again, uh, more more things to say about this than I can intelligently say. Uh, a page and a half, roughly, explaining the operation of what's going on here. Um, but again, for our purposes, what I want you to be able to identify it is uh, what control scheme would the diagram represent and what is happening with the path that the signal travels and what is being achieved um, by this new parallel cross-limited control because it is uh, it is an improvement on straight parallel metered control. So let's figure out what this cross limiting does and, and how it's represented here. So what we're doing here is we're adding selectors for cross limited control so that we can ensure there will always be excess air. So what does that mean? We have, we have selectors. So look at this, we have a greater than selector over here. Uh, we have a less than selector over here so it's going to it's going to select one of two signals for us um, 
the idea here again is to always ensure that we have excess air and i think we said on the previous one um, yes <clears throat> we said on the previous one um, that this improves our excess air situation but not completely ensuring that we have excess air so the purpose of cross limiting is to make sure we always have excess air so what happens in the previous version uh, <clears throat> when we have a change in uh, demand for for heating the the fuel valve is going to open and close as the fuel valve opens and closes the air valve also has to open and close if it closes before or after the fuel valve this is a little bit complicated it's going to have an effect on the burning of the furnace so let's say i have a, a, a demand decrease for heating in the furnace looking at the diagram that means that my fuel valve is going to close a little bit at that time that that fuel valve gets the signal to close it's also going to send a signal in parallel to the air valve telling it to close so it's going to start to close a little bit it could close a little bit faster or a little bit slower than the fuel valve if it closes faster that means we're going to have less air for a little while meaning we could have a puff of black smoke if it closes slower it means we could have excess air in the stack for a little while which means that we could have stack cooling so that's the problem in parallel meter control that we're trying to address here so in order to do that we add selectors that tell us which signal to react on first if one is less than the other or greater than the other it tells it to address it first the ilm will do a much better job explaining how that happened than i will but let's just review here where the signal goes so just like parallel it comes out of the temperature controller the demand for heat tells the fuel valve to do something at the same time because it's parallel still it's going to tell the air valve string to do something where the cross limiting comes from is once that fuel signal is a selected the lower signal I mean, this this is confusing and you'll have to you'd have to follow them all but we're not i'm not going to try to mess it up with that what happens is what's getting cross limited here is these two signals and you see this signal coming across from here to here and this signal coming across from here to here so this is why we get this cross limited control okay and what this does is it ensures that the fuel is going to lead the air on a demand decrease, meaning that the fuel is going to... Go ahead, Michael. Can't hear you. You're right, what? I muted. Uh, for this is, this is uh, cross-limited. Which signal yeah. would be dominant otherwise this may go into a dead loop that's that's the, the the selector's job here is to determine uh which which signal would be dominant and in, and in this case it's going to choose the lower of the two okay the lower of the lower of this signal coming in and this signal coming in is what's going to be the remote set point for this but read it we're not, not going to test you on a step-by-step -step exactly of, of how it operates because it's it's beyond our pay grade um i just want you to be able to identify through this diagram and a block diagram and understand why we have introduced cross limiting um and ultimately the reason that we improved on uh regular parallel metered and we've improved it by adding, adding cross limiting is in order to maintain efficiency when we get demand changes and to speak to what i was saying earlier 
uh, this line here which says fuel leads air on demand decrease and lags on increase. So that means that, let's look at this again, if I have a demand decrease, that's going to tell me that my demand for fuel is also going to go down. So I want to turn my fuel down before, right? I want my fuel to lead. So that means I close my fuel valve before I close my air valve. That means fuel leads air, which means I'm always going to have excess air and I'm not going to have a puff of black smoke going up into the air. When I have an increase in demand or a call for heat, it says that my fuel is going to lag on an increase, which means that I'm going to open the air valve a little bit first, that signal here first, before I open up the fuel valve to ensure that, again, I don't have that puff of black smoke as we go up there. And that's really what the whole process is designed for. So again, that's what it does. Uh, the ILM will probably describe it in a, in a way that's more specific, um, but the ultimate design of, of cross-limiting over just regular parallel control is in order to always, always maintain that excess air so that we don't have the very undesirable, visible puff of black smoke when we have demand changes. So it is more complicated than that, Michael, um, but it's well above uh, our pay grade. Thank you, sir. Okay, so uh, did I miss something else, Ray, or is, is that good? So I, I just got to find where the. No, I think that was. Uh, I think that was the only thing that we skipped over. Parallel meters that's not in your ILM, right? Yeah, so this is... Uh, yeah, the only thing that we have is any rate, oh, meter not, control with oxygen trim. Yeah, I'm not going to... Uh, we made it to the end here. I'm just I'm not going to bother you with my editing mistakes here. I'll go back and clean this up a little bit so that if you guys have to look at it again, it will be more in line. Um, so, yeah, um, that's the general down and dirty of ratio. It's relatively simple, unless, of course, you're uh, reading the ILM, in which case it can be it can be complicated. Um, but again, uh, the applications, uh, identifying where the signal goes and how the signal goes there, that's really how ratio operates in a nutshell, where the major concerns for us anyway as technicians. Um, yeah, very little math. Um, I don't make you do any math more complicated than, than you have in the self-test. And there is very little math uh, in the self-test. So have fun with that. Um, tomorrow, you have Tim for analyzers. And uh, we're going to do uh, signal converters next time I see you. That'll be on Wednesday. Any other questions? No, man. Thanks a lot. I eh? appreciate it. All right, you boys. Thank you, Tyler. Uh, if I'm behind the schedule, will you close the quiz opportunities or you that that quiz will still stay there for a while? No, quiz stays there. Okay, thank you.